Hey, Black Art in America family, it's Najee Dorsey with another installment of Via Talks. Recently, we had our Fine Arts Show Philadelphia installment, and it was fantastic. Part of the programming that we had for the day uh, was Kimberly Kemp, former director of the Barnes Foundation, with her conversation on the inside scoop, what really happened with the Barnes Foundation. It was a thrill for all, all that was in attendance. You had to make plans to attend our next show. Let's tune in to the conversation. Um, how many people here think that, that Dr. Barnes' will was changed and that's the reason why there's so much controversy? Okay. Would someone like to come up and here's an actual copy of the last will and testament. It is signed. It has the seal on it. Would you like to come up and you can pass that around as I talk? And when you, when, you, when you find this section where it says the foundation can't move the collection, just yell out, okay? We won't be hearing from him until I get done because um, it's not in there. I used to always speak extemporaneously because I did it so often, but now I take notes. So I have lots of pages, but we're going to go pretty quick. And hopefully there'll be time for questions afterwards. What I learned about the Barnes Foundation is central to its purpose. And it's important to dispel the myths about the Barnes Foundation and its founder, Albert Barnes. The things I'm going to share with you in this presentation are things that you may have never heard of before. So please keep your minds open to hearing the truth. Why do I always say it's the truth? It's not my perspective. I had people saying that to me last night. I'm interested to hear your perspective. Uh-uh. Barnes left an archive of over a million documents. He kept letters to and from. So there are full dialogues between him, H.L. Mencken, Ezra Pound, Booker T. Washington, Alain Locke, Greta Garbo, Vollard, Guillaume, Matisse. You can see the letters that he sent and the letter that came back. You can also see in them where he referenced other letters that he was sending to people. So if he was writing to John Work, he would also write to John Dewey and say, I just sent Work a letter about the last program for the Negro spirituals, blah, da, da, da. So he's also verifying the comments that he's making through his correspondence, and he wrote a lot. At one point, one of his assistants said that he kept the mimeograph business in business. Well, let's have the next slide. Little bit of background history. Barnes was born in the Kensington section of Philadelphia. He grew up with his parents and brother, very poor. His father lost an arm in the Civil War. His mother was a devout Methodist who is ex responsible for exposing Barnes to art. Barnes said he learned about the transformative power of art when he was eight years old. His mother took him to camp revival meetings in Merchantville, New Jersey. He also said that was when he learned about how an art experience is as close as a spiritual experience as you can get outside of worship. He also said, and I used to love to repeat this when I was online, uh, on, on the main line rather, <laughs> that from the time he was eight years old, he was addicted to Negroes. Well, Barnes graduated at 16 and went to medical school at University of Pennsylvania and then off to Germany to study pharmacology. It's there he developed his idea for Argerol, which brought him his wealth and the reason for the foundation. Next slide. Barnes had factories in Sydney, London, and Philadelphia, but it was in his Philadelphia factory he began to experiment with education. He said he employed equal numbers of black men and white women because they had the strongest work ethic in America. I should say, before I go on, Barnes had a wicked sense of humor. He was more like Albert Einstein and Groucho Marx combined. So you always had to take some of the weird things he said with a grain of salt, because he actually did threaten to eat some woman's child whole with butter, which was amazing. Same line I use. Anyway, Barnes experimented with using art as a vehicle for developing critical problem-solving skills in the factory. He would take two hours out of the eight-hour workday and have his employees discuss the art. This is not art history. We're not talking about stories. This was actually learning to understand and analyze the work. His experiments were based on the research and readings of William James, George Santayana, and the American pragmatist John Dewey. Barnes even studied with Dewey at Columbia, and they found a kindred spirit 
with their ideas about American pragmatism, social justice, and equity. His experiments in the factory led him to the creation and mission and vision of the Barnes Foundation, which opened to the public in 1925. Next slide, please. What many of you do know is the Barnes Foundation collection is among the top 10 most important art collections in the world. It has more Renoir, Cezanne, and Matisse than all the museums in Paris combined. The collection is roughly valued at about $70 billion. The Marion campus includes five buildings, 13 acres, and a 3,000-piece arboretum, also among the finest in the world. A second campus in Chester County, Pennsylvania is called Curfiel, which includes seven buildings, 137 acres, and an extraordinary collection of 18th century American decorative arts. This is now in addition to the downtown campus. The Barnes Foundation is a school dedicated to the appreciation of fine arts and the advancement of education. That's what the mission is. But what does that really mean? Next slide. The Barnes is a school. His approach to education was different, new, and fresh. Oftentimes he gets called quirky because he didn't get museum right. That's because it's not a museum, it's a school. Barnes is the first purposely multicultural collection in the United States for aesthetic, not anthropological purpose. It's not a collection assembled out of connoisseurship. To be clear, it is also not Barnes' own personal collection turned into something else upon his death. It was not a bequest. The collection was never housed in his home. The gallery was built specifically for the purposes set forth in the educational mission of the foundation. Number, uh, next slide, please. Barnes' work actually encompassed an underlying mission of social justice. Barnes thought that if he could teach people to see, it would enhance their ability to perceive. That process would build critical problem-solving skills, and you could therefore build a better democracy. The other purpose of the foundation was to show that if everyone was capable of making great beauty, how could one man look at another as inferior? He was a tireless advocate for equity and justice. He didn't talk it, he did it. That's a large part of why he has been horribly vilified all of these decades. Barnes' primary goal was to teach people to see the way that artists sees, and so what he did through ensembles, comparing the four, the four elements of art, light, line, color, and space, using aesthetic tradition and contemporary interpretation, where innovation or invention were apparent, students through discourse would find meaning. That's what the Barnes is all about. I often tell people when they go into museums, and I ran museums for 25 years, people go into museums and pretend they're libraries and they walk around and they don't talk. <laughs> That's because you're interrupting people from reading labels. Nobody talks about the art. The art, artists want you to talk about the work. We don't want you to read the labels. We could care less what's on the label. Anyway, I digress. Okay. <laughs> Next slide, please. The Barnes is really about ideas within a synergistic, highly charged aesthetic environment that combined horticulture and art. Students in this own environment bringing in their own experiences through discussion find meaning. The ensembles, or the way that the art is presented, you could look at those as aesthetic equations with the metalwork and other decorative arts in there punctuating different aesthetic statements. The ensembles were fluid and changed almost daily. Not true that he put everything up and it had to be seen a certain way. Matter of fact, in one of the letters between him and Dewey, he said one of the great dangers of what we're doing, after we leave, people are going to set it in stone and thereby destroy it. It was meant to be a dynamic classroom. Think more of a blackboard in a math department where a professor has put up a complex equation. The students would talk about that equation for the week. The next week, somebody would erase it, put up a new equation and talk about that. The ensembles changed constantly. Classes were held in the gallery with students facing the ensembles and discussing what they saw and what that meant. Imagine that. People talking about art while looking at art. The discussions were based in philosophy, encouraging students to trust themselves to talk about what they see, 
and how what they, tra what they see translates into meaning. Next slide, please. The Journal of the Art Department states, the purpose of these courses will be to apply modern psychological principles and educational methods to the study of aesthetics and art. Special effort will be made to relate the understanding of art with the understanding of life and society out of which it grows. Next slide. The program had a seven part program that included the classes at the foundation, classes in horticulture, courses in the plastic arts, which were taken through the great collections of Europe. When Barnes did send students to Europe, he not only paid them a stipend so that their families could survive here, but he, of course, paid for all of their expenses um, during their trips. The program was developed in large part by John Dewey, Lawrence Burmeyer, and Thomas Monroe. These were all men who had PhDs in philosophy. Back then, and you have to look, we always look at uh, history through a contemporary lens, but back then, the idea as we know it of art history and teaching art did not exist. This was groundbreaking work and a way to use art as a vehicle for education. Next slide. I think the, one of the most important things I'm going to share with you, and we're going to go back into some of the history. I just want to make sure you had a sort of understanding of what the foundation was. When the foundation opened in 1925, John Dewey sent his remarks to Barnes. Dewey was the first director of education at the Barnes. Dewey sent his remarks in, and Barnes sent him back. He said, I want you to be sure to mention the Negroes. I want people to know I'm serious about this business. In the opening address, he wrote that the one reason to my mind why this enterprise, this foundation, is entitled to be called epic making, monumental, is that it is not simply a building for the collection of pictures and the dissemination of knowledge about pictures. It is the expression of a profound belief that all the daily activities of life, the necessary business and commercial activities of life, may be intrinsically significant, may be made sources of joy to those who engage in them so that they can put their whole beings, not merely their hands and a small section of their brain, but their feelings and emotions into what they're doing. It is, I think, significant that you will find in this gallery one of the finest collections in the world of African art, which records the aesthetic activities of individuals whose names are not known. For it suggests that members of the Negro race, of people of African culture, have also taken a large part in the building up of the activity which has culminated in this beautiful and significant enterprise. I know of no more significant symbolic contribution than that which the work of the members of this institution have made to the solution of what sometimes seems to be not merely a perplexing but hopeless problem, that of race relations. We may well rejoice in every demonstration of artistic capacity of any race, which has been in any way repressed or looked upon as inferior. It is the demonstration of this capacity for doing beautiful and significant work which gives the best proof of the fundamental quality and equality of all people. That was the opening address that Dewey delivered in Marion, Pennsylvania in 1925. Next slide. As students approached and entered the temple of great art, through, they entered through an African lens. Barnes commissioned the Enfield Pottery Works to create terracotta designs that mimicked African art in the collection, which at the time was the largest collection of African art in the United States, again, for aesthetic, not anthropological purpose. Inside and outside, the wrought ironwork included classic design elements, the Grecian urn, a scroll, and an African mask, every five feet in the main gallery, the frieze below la danse, beautiful garlands draped, and African masks every five feet. What happened the years before the foundation opened is important to understand because it sets the tone for how groundbreaking this work was at that time and through Barnes' lifetime. Next slide, please. The year before the foundation opened, Barnes wrote, Negro art is a new note, firm, refreshing, and irresistibly stimulating. It was the force behind the radical departure of Picasso, Modigliani, and Soutine in painting, Lipschitz in sculpture, Bernard, Satie, and Honegger in music. It's a quote from Opportunity Magazine, 1924. 
But what led Barnes to this moment and what informed his ideas about how he would work with the employees and create the foundation, backing up a little bit to this. Barnes was born during Reconstruction. As a child, he would have seen the African-American population in Philadelphia quadruple. He would have heard about massacres by the hundreds of whole towns, black towns, and lynching, the resurrection of the Ku Klux Klan, which at the time had three million members in its resurgence in 1920. Roughly half of its members lived in metropolitan areas. In August 1925, 35,000 members of the Klan marched down Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington, D.C. Next slide, please. Anti-lynching legislation failed to pass in the, US in the U.S. Senate. Next slide. There, of course, was the Rosewood Massacre, one of many massacres of black towns, towns built by African Americans as sanctuary, where whites, angry whites went in with rifles and wholesale killed people. Next slide. Misogyny laws were enacted in Virginia. Let me say that again. Misogyny laws were enacted in Virginia. Next slide. And of course, this famous one. This, by the way, is supposedly, purportedly, um, the march in which, oh, it's so hard to say his name, in, in which 45's father, I usually call him the orangutan. I'm sorry if there's any Republicans here. Um, Donald Trump's father was actually arrested in this particular um, incident. There's, his name is on the arrest record. I have that at home if you want to call me and find out later. Next slide. It's always so hard. In Philadelphia, Samuel Morton, a doctor, is uh, responsible for the rise in what we call scientific racism. In the 1920s, scientists hatched outrageous ideas to settle the question at the heart of American racial thought about what the differences were between racial groups and were they driven by environment or heredity. The National Research Council and the Social Science Research Council conducted experiments in racial orphanages to determine if African Americans were inherently less intelligent than their white counterparts. Scientists as Samuel Morton, who was in Philadelphia, believed in a hierarchical form of intelligence, that human races evolved from separate origins, and that skull capacity determined intelligence. So what he would do is take empty skulls of African Americans and fill them with shot or water and say if he could determine the, by volume who was supposed to be smarter. Next slide. Albert Barnes came of age during the period of the great debate between Booker T. Washington and W.E.B. Du Bois about the content and character of education for African Americans. His engagement with the arts grew out of his interest in education and his utter and complete intolerance for segregation and discrimination. Barnes wrote, my principal interest has always been in education first for myself and then for those less fortunate than me than in the education of the public in general. This is Albert Barnes to Alice Dewey, 1920. Central to the foundation's mission and vision was a plan for Negro education. The plan represents a practical experience of 20 years application of the principles of scientific education to the various problems of Negro life in America, in which application had been productive of such startling practical results of benefit to the Negro that it was unanimously decided to present the plan to the educational world. The idea is to show the principles at work and to simplify them so that they may be made up applied practically to all phases of Negro life. Its value to all classes of Negroes from the highly cultured to the illiterate has been demonstrated. Barnes opened the foundation with a 40 page description of a plan for Negro education that he was developing not for African Americans, but with African Americans. He worked with the NAACP, he worked with the Urban League, National Urban League, but it was with the Urban League that he was able to find, as in many ways, a lifelong friend um, after that. Um, NAACP was too busy with lynchings and murders to get involved in education. Barnes believed that education was not a thing upon itself, but was 
a part of life and that could address every possible problem that life had. He said, it has been shown that in any phase of human activity, the church, factory, lodge, or club, in fact, any institution which human beings have found interesting or necessary may be made the means of attaining a degree of education and culture which is capable of developing the full capacities of any individual. Next slide, please. This is so weird. Anyway, the practical carrying out of the plan was exclusively in the hands of African Americans. Barnes worked with Charles S. Johnson, who at the time was at the National Urban League, as well as James Weldon Johnson of the NAACP, the Alpha Phi Alpha Fraternity, and many social and civic organizations springing up in Philadelphia to serve newly migrated African Americans, including the Florida Lee Club, the Armstrong Club, and many others. Next slide, please. Barnes did not dictate, rather he put the plan in the hands of African Americans. After each and every meeting, Barnes purchased copies of Opportunity Magazine, the publication of the National Urban League by the thousands. His deep dive into the African-American community garnered him invitations far and wide, including the Association of Negro Life, colleges, and universities. It's somewhere in these meetings that I think Barnes became familiar with the New Jersey Manual Training Institute for Colored Youth in Bordentown. Next slide, please. Barnes said that Dewey, Burmeyer, and Monroe were white people, white men who were known all over the world for their contributions to education and science in general and for their special desire to see the Negro realize his native endowments which have developed and added such a marvelous contribution to the spiritual richness of our age. I, I put this in here because a lot of, I have had so many people who love Einstein and have never heard this quote. The separation of the races is not a disease of colored people. It is a disease of white people. And I do not intend to be quiet about it. Next slide, please. At some point, Barnes became uh, exposed to the New Jersey Manual Training Institute for Colored Youth Bordentown Glee Club. Barnes had, after all, from the time he was eight years old, a love for Negro spirituals. In this relationship, he met Frederick Work who was the Glee Club director. Frederick's brother, John Work, was the choir director for the Fisk Jubilee Singers. Barnes had the Glee Club come to Marion and sing on the lawn multiple times over the years to interracial audiences, including, as he called it, the gang from Princeton, which included Albert Einstein. Attendees also included Stokowski, and interestingly, the mother of one of my childhood friends, who when I talked to her and she was, I was getting ready for a meal and then she was standing there talking and she was at, by then she was like in her 90s and she said, oh, and Dr. Barnes and Mrs. Barnes were so nice. I said, wait, 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 what? <laughs> she said, oh, we used to go there and sing on the lawn all the time. Really? I said, did, did Barnes like lecture people about African-Americans or race? She said, oh, no, no, no. I said, well, what did he do? She said, oh, he put people together sitting together that ordinarily wouldn't talk to each other. Negro preachers next to businessmen and lawyers. And afterwards, we'd have chicken and cold water in the kitchen and all eat together. So that was it. She said, yeah, we did it several times during the year. Barnes actually sent the Glee Club to Europe to perform on him. Paid. He was an extremely generous man. Um, there's one story, just a, a quick aside, the uh, athletic club downtown, uh, not the athletic, yeah, that's it, Union League. Barnes wanted the choir to perform at the Union League, and Frederick Work wrote to him, and he said, I don't think we can do that, because Paul Robeson was there about three weeks ago, and they made him come in through the kitchen. Barnes said, that's not going to happen to the gang. I'll see to it. He wrote letters to the exact people he needed to talk to, and when the young men and women from the college, from the school showed up, they walked up the steps through the front door. Next slide. Before the foundation opened, Barnes was regularly in communication with Charles S. Johnson about his grand plan for education. 
He wrote about his views on African Americans in the country before the foundation opened. He did radio addresses and spoke on, often at meetings up and down the East Coast. Can I have the next slide, please? This is their invitation card um, that appeared in the, uh, that he would send out. And he kept all the lists of people invited and all those who attended. Next slide. In his article on Opportunity Magazine, the year before the foundation opened in March 1924, he spoke directly to his interest and passion. It is the start of the cowardice, hatred, and ignorance of attacks against Barnes that regrettably live on today. Barnes wrote, the cultured white race owes to the sole expressions of its black brothers too many moments of happiness not to acknowledge ungrudgingly the significant fact that what the Negro has achieved is of tremendous civilizing value. From 1924, that there should have been developed a distinctly Negro art in America was natural and inevitable. A primitive race transported into an Anglo-Saxon environment and held in subjugation to that fundamentally alien influence was bound to undergo the soul-stirring experiences which have always found their expression in great art. The white man en masse cannot compete with the Negro in spiritual endowment. He has wandered too far from the elementary human needs. Hey, Black Art America family, did you know we just opened up our new space in Columbus, Georgia? The next time that you visit Georgia, make plans to venture to Columbus and take in the Black Art America headquarters and home of the Najee Dorsey Studios. We're open by appointment Monday through Friday, but you can catch us on the weekend, Saturday and Sunday from 11 to 5 p.m. And be sure to shop with us at shopbuyaonline.com for works by some of the hottest contemporary artists and our legacy artists as well. Almost immediately, the township and the neighborhood association were on the attack and the foundation was more successful than Barnes had ever imagined. In the middle of a battle to maintain the stature of the neighborhood, Barnes wrote, I assure you that we believe in the Negro because he has proved class and an intellect and a creator to hell with the white man's prejudice. Barnes attempt, attempted to launch a voter awareness program for African Americans. He figured that if he could get people to come out and vote, they could turn the tide in Philadelphia and the state. This is a hundred years ago, a hundred years ago. He had already written several articles about African art and its influence on the art of Europe. Next slide, please. He wrote, I have in my house ample proof in the works of these moderns that much of their inspiration came from the ancient Negro. Barnes invites H.L. Mencken and James Weldon Johnson to come and stay, open quote, so that you could see the pre-dawn of a new era of the black race in art matters. When art is recognized, the step to social justice should not be so big if backed up by the trained minds of the Negroes who have devoted their lives to these causes. He also did a national radio address of the same kind of uh, uh, tone um, that was about African art and modern uh, sculpture. Next slide. Well, the students that attended the Barnes were mostly working artists, and they came from up and down the East Coast, quite a number of them early on. Matter of fact, Aaron Douglas was among, these were uh, three of the four artists who were among the first class of the Barnes. I'm going to go through some of this kind of a uh, little bit quick. It was Aaron Douglas, um, Gwendolyn Bennett, Langston Hughes. Next slide. Aaron Douglas's work and, of course, the um, uh, program um, cover for the uh, testimonial for James for Charles Johnson before he left Opera, uh, National Urban League and went down to Fisk. Next slide. Another one of his wonderful works. Uh, next slide. Mary Elizabeth Prophet, African American sculptor. Next slide. Another one of her pieces. Next slide. Gwendolyn Bennett, hard to find her work online, but I found some. Next slide. 
Tell me if we're painting next, please. Alan Freelon, who is Phil Freelon's father. Phil Freelon is the architect who designed the African American Museum at the Smithsonian. I work with him on the Gantt Center in North Carolina. And his daughter, Maya Freelon, an exceptional artist. Next slide, please. And here is some of his work. Next slide. James Porter, who founded the art department at Howard University. Next slide. And of course, Horace Pippin. Next slide. Another work by Pippin. So many of the African-American students who attended the Barnes Foundation were eager to travel south so they could help elevate the race. Claude Clark went to teach at Talladega College where he created an art department and he ran headlong into the segregation and discrimination that Barnes absolutely hated. Claude Clark wrote to Barnes and said that his students were accepted in the festival at the University of Alabama but the director of the festival had written and said the art could come, but the students couldn't because it was segregated. So Barnes contacted their keynote speaker, who was a former employee of the Barnes, and said, if you men go down there, people will think, and I'll read to you, he says, I'm getting requests to know whether the use of our name in connection with the art festival to be held at the University of Alabama on April 22nd and 23rd, 1949, indicates that we favor segregation of the races. My uniform reply is that we oppose it, that the name was used without our knowledge or consent. Thomas Monroe pulled out of the festival. They invited Lawrence Burmeyer. Barnes wrote another letter. Lawrence Burmeyer pulled out of the festival. The next year, the festival was integrated and the art director had been fired. Next slide. Another picture of Claude. He's a wonderful guy. I had a chance to know him quite well. It's another piece of pieces from Talladega College. Next slide. James Bland. Many of you may or may not know this man. He is the composer who wrote Carry Me Back to Old Virginia and Odom Golden Slippers. He's actually buried in what was called at that time the Cemetery for Negroes and Chinese in Marion. Now it's called Marion Gardens. Barnes found out that Bland was buried there in a grave that was poorly marked and he felt that Bland was as much an important composer as was Stephen Foster. And so he started an effort to have a proper memorial for Bland. He contacted and was in touch with um, W.C. Handy. He called Paul Robeson and Josephine Baker and said, just tell them that they can remember last, last summer when we were in Paris and had a gay time. I'm sure they would want to help us. Again, because Barnes didn't do things for African Americans. He did things with African Americans. Unfortunately, the local leaders were not sympathetic to having a memorial in Marion, and one of the newspapers, which will remain unnameless, printed an editorial that said, there goes Albert Barnes again, trying to create a place for end lovers to gather in Marion. Next slide. There now is a memorial, ASCAP put one there, so if you go to Marion Gardens, you can see it. Well, this is one of the most touching stories about Barnes and, and, and I think really gives you the character and an understanding of who he really was. A young student by the name of Abilene Lockhart traveled to the Barnes Foundation to study. She came from Oakland um, and she later became a field researcher for Barnes. She wrote him, as many of the letters will say, Dear Dr. Barnes, I am a young Negro. Many of the letters started that way. It's one of the easiest ways we have of finding out who some of the African Americans were. I actually met Abilene Lockhart at Claude Clark's funeral. She was his sister-in-law. She came to the foundation to study. Barnes found out that she was a virtuoso vocalist. So he sent her up to the New Jersey Manual Training Institute, but he also had something else in mind. And he asked her if she would become a field researcher and go south and collect traditional Negro spirituals because gospel mu music was taking over. And we all know there's a big difference between gospel music and spirituals. Barnes didn't know that when they reopened. They actually had gospel music at the opening, but that's a whole other kind of, it's like, all right, not quite right, but okay. Anyway, so Abilene Lockhart coming from Oakland, coming to Philadelphia, and she's now going to go south and collect traditional Negro spirituals. 
she was only going to be gone for a couple of months. And usually Barnes would leave and go to Europe. So she had a little bit of an introduction that was kind of rocky. She wrote, when I boarded the train, she was in Cincinnati heading south. When I boarded the train, I was so busy waving goodbye while finding a seat, I didn't realize what and where I was until I looked around and saw all the Negroid faces. The light dawned. I was Jim Crowed. Well, it was too late to become properly angry about a feeling of futility, stirring the atmosphere and a sad sense of resigned satisfaction. At which Barnes said, eh, 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 eh. you're in the South. You need to forget all of that stuff. You have a mission. Don't let people detract you. So she first goes down and she starts talking to elders and people in the churches. And here she is from Oakland and they didn't trust her. So she couldn't get anybody to sing with her. So then she started sitting with the children and singing with the children. And the elders noticed that she was singing with the children and she began to be able to find these traditional Negro spirituals. She goes further and further south. When she's at Fisk, Charles S. Johnson hosts her and John Work. And they told her, and she writes in one of the letters to Barnes, and she said that, that, <laughs> that Mr. Johnson told her she can't go into town acting the way she was or she'd get her face slapped. She also wrote and said she was on a bus one time and was told to get on the back, and she realized she caught herself. Because when she looked up, she saw Negro soldiers in uniform and realized that my one inconvenience could have started a major row. So she's starting to really sort of understand where she is and be in that moment. She continues to, to travel further and further. Next slide, please. Oh, back up. Oh, can you back up the other one? Sorry. She actually makes her way to G's Bend. The letters that she writes, and I'll just read excerpts from a couple of these because I just wanted you to get the sense of what a transformative plan Barnes had and how it worked. She's in G's Bend, her tone has changed and she writes, quiet peace lingered over it nightly. At intermittent moments in the dark stillness, a sorrowful voice would shatter the darkness, pleading, O oh Lord, O oh Lord. Out of the heat of sorrow came mournful cries. They echoed and re-echoed in our minds, first one voice, then two. They multiplied in one contagious sound. They cried, oh Lord, please Lord. We saw the multitude body bent, picking cotton. The sun seared our bodies, yes, our bodies. We were in the multitude. Beads of sweat rushed down over our faces. We didn't seem to mind the dripping salt water or the sun growing hotwardly out. But within, we moaned silent prayers to ourselves. Not meditations metered out of carefully thought out prayer, but prayer born out of crushed bodies, reeking with pain. Prayers born out of never ending weary born state. She continues to travel. She's sending information up and she ends her travels at Penn School in South Carolina. And the letter she wrote there to Barnes reads as follows. Spiritual songs are altogether different here than in other places. The continuity of a song is kept flowing into its larger rhythmical pattern at all times, and the more minute forms fall and without a break. Here the spirituals are sung with a Renoir flow, with his multicolor variations flowing one into the other. It's hard to capture their many shadings. Spirituals we have heard in some places are sung with a rigid punch, yet the technical pattern is very much controlled. The song, Sit Down, seems to have the rhythmical, rhythmical and tonal variations in design, which correlate with African sculpture. Others seem to strike me in that manner. The song, Go Down Moses, experiences the power and disciplined movements of Cezanne. Upon looking into the many faces of my race on plantations and elsewhere, I found out just how much we need to become aware of our own heritage and how we need to champion its greatness and how children actually need to be inspired with actual knowledge that our own heritage and culture has much to offer civilization. Just as our forefathers learned to use their imagination 
to appreciate life about them momentarily, we, Negro youth, must learn to draw upon that imaginative power and express that which is about us. Abilene Lockhart went on to move to Los Angeles and she became an advocate for public education. She actually wrote Barnes about 10 years later. She apologized for not being in touch. And she had become such an advocate for African-American education that she, in the letter, talked about how the many people had a, painted a target on her forehead. Now she didn't care because she was doing this work as important. Next slide, please. And then there's Lincoln University. Barnes' relationship with Lincoln University and his attempts to try to get Lincoln students and the university engaged in the program was the same as he had done with every other college and university in the Philadelphia area. By 1930, there were over 130 colleges, universities, and K through 12 school systems who had adopted Barnes pedagogy. With the exception of Central High and Girls High, none of the schools in Philadelphia had adopted his program. These two excerpts from letters shortly before Barnes died, I think really summarize what his intentions were when it came to Lincoln University. The players being, uh, have Horace Mann Bond on the left, Sing Nan Fen, the Chinese gentleman who studied with Dewey in China, John Dewey, of course, and Albert Barnes, and then also Dean Hill, who was the dean at the school at the time. And Barnes wrote, You've been so cooperative in our experiment with Lincoln that you're entitled to a frank statement of how I size up the situation as it exists factually. And now about next year at Lincoln, providing Dr. Bond things that were going on, and we could assure that there would be no forces acted at Lincoln to counteract what we offer, Dewey knows what your philosophy course is because he saw the correspondence between your professor and myself. Another fact that Dewey knows is the futility of using the academic setup as demonstrated by our experiments on three occasions with prominent colleges, one of them University of Pennsylvania. The only possible way to make our resources really serviceable to Lincoln is by a method of trial and error and to fulfill conditions which experience shows are indispensable. These are, number one, a rational philosophic foundation, two, a trained teacher, three, selected students, and number four, a first class in fundamental principles of orderly thinking, scientific method, and authentic experience. This year's experiment with Lincoln failed in practically all of these requisites, in spite of your zeal and intelligent cooperation, and my efforts to start it right. When I saw that the teacher was inadequate, I suggested that you enter the Tuesday class so you could see what was being done. Barnes is referring to the fact that Lincoln's philosophy program was based in German Romanticism. Barnes' thinking was based in American pragmatism. He suggested that Sing Nan Fen, who at the time was a philosophy professor at Howard University with Alain Locke, Barnes suggested he come to Lincoln and work with the faculty and students there so they could take full advantage of the program that he offered. Horace Mann Bond said no, he was not interested. Within a few days, Barnes wrote another letter that says, your letter of May 24th seems to affirm what the prospectus cries out, i.e., that an enterprise dedicated to the welfare of the Negro race and the general social betterment is wishful thinking presides over the blueprint for sound educational methods outlined in the excerpt experience in thinking which I sent you. We reversed the choice when 28 years ago we started to accomplish an identical purpose by the foundation. Judged by this criterion, the four fellows you mentioned correspond to the icing on the cake that you have not the recipe to bake. All this makes me sad because it forecasts things to come that make impossible what I had hoped to do for Lincoln, namely, carry on there. And to your credit, what we have done alone for so many years. Mr. Hill, as a member of our Tuesday class, saw for himself what that is. I hold no brief for Dr. Fenn, but unless a man of his background is in residence at Lincoln to coordinate philosophy and art, beginning next fall, I prefer to pass out of the picture. Our institution has thrived by scientific method. 
These two subjects were amalgamated and made an instrument of education. Philosophy at Lincoln is a kind of intellectual calisthenics carried out in an ivory tower with all the doors and windows hermetically sealed from contact with the world in which we live. That's nuts. <laughs> Next slide, please. John Lukacs' book, 1900 to 1950, and he writes of Barnes, the patron of art out of Argerol. This is how people remember Barnes after he died, if they remember him at all. Barnes is deliberately omitted from books about the history of the city and of its art. Lukacs said, part and parcel of the national habit of shortness of memory, especially when it is not jogged by relentless publicity. But there is something prototypical, prototypically Philadelphian about it, typical of the well-mannered but regrettable habit of unwillingness to think about unpleasant matters, unpleasant situations, and unpleasant people. In some, Barnes was forgotten because he had to be forgotten. He believed in the educability of the common man. His foundation was officially dedicated not to the art, but to cause of education. Lukacs continues, so often has Philadelphia favored the second, if not third rate, due to some sort of provincial suspicion well hidden behind a successfully maintained pose of patrician reserve. It's easy to be deceived by this pose, as if it were a natural reserve of confident and cultured patricians. What lies beneath it is embarrassment, an unwillingness to take risks, and more often, an unwillingness to think. Next slide. But why was he vilified still, called quirky, demented, and worse? You can't find his name inside of the New Barnes Foundation nor anything honoring its mission or vision or purpose, to serve people who make their living in shops, stores, and factories, and African Americans who are conspicuously missing in its senior ranks. Barnes was the only place where you saw great art through an African lens. What did he do to deserve this? Barnes wrote, my principal interest has always been in education first for myself, then for those less fortunate than me, and then in the education of the public again. Every museum has an education department attempting to do what Barnes did. But why is he so hated? To live democracy is to understand experience and education as life. Next slide. Now, I read this circle here because this is the front of the new Barnes. And you see the circle here, it's behind the front door. Next slide. That's the only place that you will see his name at the Barnes Foundation. To close, I will read you this. And this is from Opportunity Magazine, 1926. Um, and I think is, is one of my favorite uh, pieces that Barnes wrote. And I just add a little excerpt here. This mystic whom we have treated as a vagrant proved his possession of a power to create out of his own soul and our own America, moving beauty of an individual character whose existence we never knew. We're beginning to recognize that what the Negro singers and sages have said is only what an ordinary Negro feels and thinks in his own measure every day of his life. We've paid more attention to that everyday Negro and have been surprised to learn that nearly all of his activities are shot through and through with music and poetry. When we take to heart the obvious fact that what our prosaic civilization needs most is precisely the poetry which the average Negro actually lives, it's incredible that we should not offer the consideration which we have consistently denied to him. If at that time he is the simple, ingenuous, forgiving, good-natured, wise, and obliging person that he has been in the past, he may consent to form a working alliance with us for the development of a richer American civilization to which he will contribute his full share. Great beauty in order to be accessible has to be taken out of the artist's studio and put into view. It can be in your home, your office, your place of worship, schools, other venues. Do it for the greater good. It's the best reason there is to buy art. If, if it's great art, it should shift your worldview. It should change the way you think about yourself and others. It should support the idea that this greater democracy 
will be even better if we're allowed to contribute our full share. Thank you. All right, Black Art in America family, you listened to another installment of Bio Talks. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to find us on your favorite social media platform. And we're trying to get our numbers up on the YouTube channel. So subscribe, check us out, and sign up for the newsletters that we're getting. If you're not getting our newsletters, hit us up. We want to make sure that you're getting all our content. And if we can be of any further assistance, um, you got any projects coming up, anything exciting, uh, drop us a line. We always want to know what's going on with the community.